All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, are there any questions before we begin on the topics we've been covering in the past few lectures or your assignments? Uh, ask them in the chat below if so. And I will take a look at that as we go throughout. So uh, today our focus is on implementing variability through the use of design patterns in your code. Um, design patterns are a load or runtime bound language-based, composition-based approach for variability implementation. So what that means is we choose our features, our options, either when the program is executed, load time, or while it runs, configuring as the program itself continues to operate. Um, it's implemented using the mechanisms of the programming language through the code itself, rather than through the use of external tools. And features are encapsulated as separate units that we then merge together rather than having the code for multiple features mixed in one particular file or one particular class. So design patterns are descriptions of collaborating objects and classes that are customized to solve a general design problem in a particular context. They're essentially recipes for implementing certain forms of behavior within a system. Uh, and I'm sure you've talked about these in some form before. They're a classic object-oriented design technique. They have a major place in all sorts of aspects of software design and evolution. Um, but they have a major place here in this particular class because they're one of the easier ways to implement reusable assets in a seamless and extendable way so that you can allow your system to evolve over time by slotting in new features, new forms of functionality, retiring how other forms, uh, retiring other forms of um, functionality when they're no longer necessary, or changing how things work in a controlled manner. They let you control how your system evolves over time. Um, the goal today is not to cover patterns that are done to death in a general object-oriented design class. We're not going to talk about observers or visitors, those kind of things. But I do want to highlight six patterns, uh, some complex, some much simpler, that are especially suited to uh, long-term evolving systems, to reuse-driven systems like product lines or like other systems where you want to be able to support uh, different types of functionality in a seamless manner based on options chosen by the user um, while the program is running. Design patterns are one of our most major means of language-based implementation. So we can start by going way, way back to our object-oriented design principles, the kind of things you talked about in your first year. And we're implementing ducks. Right, a whole product line of ducks. I don't know why we're programming virtual ducks. Maybe we've got the new Elder Scrolls game and we want to have realistic duck behaviors in nature. I, I don't know. Anyway, we want to implement several ducks. Um, ducks quack, they swim, they fly. So it seems pretty reasonable that you might want to use inheritance so that you can add dozens of different ducks and just inherit those common attributes and operations from the parent. Is that okay? Could that get you into trouble? Well, using inheritance gives you good reuse of operations in the initial design, but it isn't always the answer and it might end up getting you into more trouble as you go to change the system later on. What if you add new ducks to this product line? What if it's a rubber duck? Rubber ducks quack in a sense, right? You squeeze them and make noises. You could argue that they swim, they, they certainly float at least, but they certainly don't swim or act in the same way that the other ducks do. And unless you throw them, they aren't really flying around. So one option you have is to override a method that you inherit with your own version. That's often the useful trick, right? And you inherit certain methods from the parents, just gab that code wholesale. Uh, but the behavior isn't necessarily intended to be the same, so you can override that behavior with your own local version of flying or swimming. How about that? Right. Well, let's say that now we want to add yet another one. We want to add this wooden duck. Um, maybe that'll float, right? Wooden models often do, but it doesn't quack. It doesn't fly. It 
would make sense maybe to group it with ducks in our program still. But we're reaching a breaking point with trying to override behaviors. Uh, defeats the point of inheritance, right? Why bother inheriting behaviors if you're not going to use them, if they're not actually shared? Uh, the point is to localize your functionality to the parent. So a change in one place changes it everywhere. Only write the code once and edit that code and then inherit it. It isn't much use if we just override everything. So another option, what about interfaces, the, the Java interface structure, right? In these, we don't implement a shared behavior, but we define a contract. This What an interface does in Java is it says, all right, anything that implements this interface will offer these particular methods. We promise that we won't let it compile otherwise. Um, so we could define interfaces for some of these behaviors. Anything that implements the flyable interface can fly. Anything that implements the quackable interface can quack, right? And so we've got these interfaces strip them out from our original duck. We have those as interfaces and we can implement our ducks. They all swim. Uh, they might share data attributes, great. And when appropriate, they implement the right interfaces, right? So a mallard can fly and quack and inherits swimming and implements display method from the parents. The red-headed duck can fly and quack uh, the rubber duck can quack, but it can't fly, and the wooden duck can't do either of those, right? So it doesn't bother implementing those interfaces. Uh, this design gives us assurance that if an object can fly or quack, you know how to call that behavior, right? You know those methods are being offered, and there's that contract in place stating that you know, the mallard duck implements a method called fly. It implements a, a method called quack. Uh, good. Is this a better design, though? I mean, this this is starting to look a little convoluted, right? We know not all ducks fly, so inheritance isn't our right answer. Uh, but this use of interfaces only solves part of the problem. A big point of inheritance is the idea that we don't implement the same code in multiple places. With only an interface in place, we have to implement that behavior each time, and that likely means the same flying or quacking behavior is going to appear in multiple places in our code. Maintenance, bug fixes, those are still going to be a huge nightmare. So how do we fix this mess? Uh, we can ignore tools like inheritance and interfaces for a second and think about the core reason that these tools exist. Uh, a big reason that object-oriented design was invented in the first place and why we make use of it is that we can think of the system as these independent blocks, right? these individual elements that live on their own, that function largely on their own, and then they come together with other pieces of our system to do big tasks, right? But there are Legos, there are building blocks. Um, let's identify then what changes and isolate that from what doesn't. Isolate the assets of our product line, our ducks, from the specific application code that uses those assets. So we have ducks, what never changes? Let's take that and put that into some parent class. The basis for all of our other ducks, create a template of sorts for every single asset to implement. So what does change between our different ducks? Let's take that and isolate that. So for one thing, uh, how they fly or don't fly as the case may be. Uh, what kind of noises they make or not make as the case may be. So separate what never changes about the ducks, right? Um, the basically our application side from the behaviors that do change the assets from our product line that we're reusing. And so that later you can alter or extend of the parts that may change without affecting the parts of the system that will remain concrete. So we want to separate what never changes from what does. Our first inclination might be to do something like this, right? Create our, our duck class, create children, just program flying and quacking in when needed only in each of the children, implementing whatever behavior we need independently of the parent, right? So the parent has swimming and this display method, those are always going to be there. The child is going to add in you know, this flying and quacking behavior. Uh, this isn't quite there yet, though. This, this means that when we want a duck to fly, we need to know what duck we're working with and how to call the right method. 
Now, of course, we could go back to saying uh, the duck has fly and quack methods and override those. This is better, right? We know the ducks have the same methods. We know they all have a method called fly, one called quack, even if we change those in the children. Uh, we know they have the same methods, so we don't need to know which duck we're working with. Call the fly method, you'll get the appropriate behavior. But as we've talked about earlier, this also isn't great either, as we need to re-implement the same behavior multiple times. But there's an important lesson here, which is the idea of programming to an interface, not an implementation. Even if the result varies, we always offer the same way to assess the appropriate version of the same type of behavior offer that assurance, no, no matter what type of duck we have, we can call the fly method, we can call the quack method, and we'll get the appropriate response for the actual concrete unit we're making use of. Now, how do we do this right? So what we want to do is take those flying behaviors and program them once, right? And encapsulate them in independent units that we plug in when needed, right? We wanna be able to plug in the correct option, but call it in, with a universal interface, call it, in a way that we can rely on regardless of what type of flying behavior it is. But now we have this set of reusable, of pluggable assets, right? Flying with wings, flying not allowed, uh, flying with bat wings, I don't know, whatever else we'd want to implement, flying with a jet engine, right? And each of those is contained in its own unit that we then plug in, implementing an interface so that we know what to call, right? No matter what duck of, type of duck we have, we can call a fly method and it's going to delegate it to the right particular plugin, right? So in the duck itself, we're going to say that it will have a flying behavior and a quacking behavior. It's going to have some sort of pointer to these plugins, to these objects that, that represent the different very the, the different variants that we can have, right? Uh, the different features we can implement. Um, all children inherit those attributes, those pointers, but in the child, we assign the appropriate instance of flying or quacking, right? So uh, you know, each duck we instantiate, we can attach the right version uh, the, based on the options that we've chosen, right? The code for the right feature. And we can access that behavior in a universal way without needing to know what duck it is or what version of flying it is. We'll get the right result. And that's good object-oriented design. Right? And that brings us to a principle that's being followed here, the idea that um, inheritance is useful, but it's not always the answer. Often we should favor instead composition over inheritance, right? Taking class, linking it to the appropriate building blocks that have been attached onto it, and forming a combined class from this composition of our duck, its flying behavior, and its quacking behavior. They come together to form a new concrete instance, right? Um, a duck has a flying behavior, has a quacking behavior, but instead of inheriting behavior from parent classes, making overrides, we implement those once and compose new versions of a class with the right building blocks. We restrict a duck to what is true of all ducks and build a new one from the right set of behaviors, right? It's this idea of composition, building a class from small independent building blocks, something that we've repeated over and over again when talking about product lines and other reuse driven systems. Um, inheritance can be great, but only for things that are shared between a parent and a child, right? We only want to, sh to share code if it makes sense. Composition is better for those aspects that vary and can change over time. So often has a, has a flying behavior, has a quacking behavior is better than the idea of is a, you know, is a, is a duck, right? Um, so those are some fundamental lessons of object-oriented development, things I'm sure, again, that you've talked about before, but they, they can take some work to apply in practice. Um, but there, we can learn from the experience of others on similar projects. Um, don't start design by listing a set of classes. Start by describing a problem that you're addressing. Someone's probably solved that problem before. And some of our experience have been summarized by what we call design patterns. Uh, and design patterns serve as a reference guide for design for particular types of systems or development situations. They offer design guidelines, right? And these are a really useful way to implement variability in a system. Whether you're doing a formal product line or not, right? If you are just want to design a system that evolves over time where you're going to have aspects that you can make a choice between, 
you know, different flying behaviors. We can choose between them when composing a child class, a new type of duck. Quacking behaviors, we can choose between them. Any case where you could choose between different options and might want to vary those options. Uh, design patterns are a really useful way to make this happen within your code in a way that allows the system to evolve, that minimizes the amount of code that you need to edit separately or, make, or um, make a change whenever you want to make a single change, right? And design a system that's going to be efficient and evolve over time. Now, those guidelines um, are, or these are guidelines. Design patterns are guidelines, not a full wholesale solution to a problem, right? A nice quote from Christopher Alexander, guy who popularized what a design pattern is. He said, well, every pattern describes a problem that occurs over and over again in an environment and that describes the core of the solution to that problem in a way that you can use that solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice. Right, so uh, that really helps describe what a design pattern is. They offer a head start to design, the core of a solution to a problem. They're not a library of code you plug in, right? You won't find patterns that replace your system, but there's structure and guidance for designing that system. A set of instructions will ideally result in a better design for your particular problem. In our case, better support for customization and expansion of our available options over time, uh, and better support for system evolution over time. Right, and we've already basically implemented one pattern here, what's called the strategy pattern. Uh, the strategy pattern is a behavioral pattern, so it's a way of structuring the behavior of your system, where algorithms describe different behaviors. You take those algorithms, you implement them as distinct units, and you make those units interchangeable by ensuring they all offer the same interface. We can swap one form of flying for another at runtime. You don't need to know specifics. This allows seamless management of variability. Just attach the right options at runtime, call it as you would any other option, and it should work. You can add in new assets, new behaviors to that set over time and make use of them by binding the appropriate class at runtime. Um, this pattern is also nice because it, is, it offers runtime implementation of variability. You can reconfigure your system as it runs by swapping one behavior choice for a different one. And ideally, as long as you've designed your code properly, it should all function, okay? So that's one design pattern uh, that's useful for implementing product lines or other variable systems, right? So we also have a few more we're going to discuss. And our second one is what's called the factory pattern. Uh, this directly borrows from the idea of, well, of, a, of an assembly line, of a product line in a factory. In manufacturing, you end up creating multiple versions of the same product with different choices being made, right? That motivation should sound familiar. So you're building a new laptop. The, the process is the same for every instance of a laptop that you build, but the uh, individual parts might differ, right? Um, you might have different, you know, different CPUs, Right, different hard drive capabilities, different choices you make. And you often see the same thing, you know, if you're talking about a restaurant, uh, two customers might order a pizza, but they're not the same pizza. There's different toppings. You know, if you go to any pizza shop here, you see like 90 different options. You know, again, sound familiar. As you know, these situations happen often in software as well. And that's where that factory pattern, which is a creational pattern and organizes the creation of objects in the system comes into play, allowing us to exploit polymorphism to create the right type of object and change what options we offer without ever rewriting code in several parts of the program. All right, so you know, let's say we're building the, the web shop for our pizza store. Ordering a pizza sets up a sequence of events uh, where you're going to prepare, bake, cut, box, and finally ship out the pizza. Regardless of the type of pizza we order, those steps are going to remain the same, though the specifics of what happens when we call a step might vary by class, right? It's like what we talked about a little bit earlier at the Ducks, uh, but there's something missing here, just deciding what kind of pizza we're going to order, right? So how do you control that? Well, our first stab at this, we can add an argument for setting the pizza type. It's going to take in a string that's the name of this particular pizza. And we'll use a big set of conditional statements to filter and instantiate the right type. Right, so we're gonna pass in and just check through each of these. And then whenever we get the right one, we'll create the right class and begin preparing the pizza. 
Right. So if it's cheese, if it's if it's, we said cheese, it's a cheese pizza. If it's pepperoni, it's pizza with pepperoni, and so on. Is that is that going to be a problem? Well, our menu's not going to remain static forever, right? We need to add new pizza types, or we need to remove old ones, and that can get hard to evolve over time. Um, a big, huge stack of if, else, if, else, if, and so on statements is um is something that's not exactly friendly to change. You have to modify it over and over again, while the rest of the the meth the um the rest of this order pizza method, the preparation methods, you know, bake it, box it, ship it out, etc. Those are things that will likely remain the same. Right? There's, that's code that just assumes that you have a pizza that offers a certain set of methods and it doesn't care about the underlying implementation. The, the part that's going to change is the, the types of pizzas we allow to order. So this if then else block, this pizza selection code um, is something that's going to change often and it's something that's likely to appear in multiple places in the system and you'll need to change it there as well. So this isn't a design that's completely conducive to change, right? So what we want to do is take this pizza instantiation code out of every place that appears in the system, just rip that if statement out, and instead encapsulate the pizza instantiation code in a special type of object we call factory, right? Factories handle the details of object creation. So this order pizza method is now a client of the pizza factory. And when we, you know, the, the order pizza method doesn't really care what kind of pizza it is. It just cares that you, that it gets a, a pizza object and can, and then can call the prepare, bake, cut box and, and then just return the whole thing. Um, it just cares that it has a valid pizza object to work with and implements an interface so that we know that, so that it implements the same prep methods regardless of what type of pizza it is. So what we can do is we can delegate object creation to this factory object. The order pizza method will, will go to that factory and pass that type string and get back an object and it'll work with that object. We don't need to know what kind of pizza it is. We don't care what its toppings are, what dough it uses, et cetera. We don't really care. It, it just needs to implement the interface so that when we call prepare on it, it's prepared in the proper way. That we call, when we call bake, it's baked in the right way and so on, right? It just need to have this object and the factory will create the object for us. Now we're not quite to the full pattern yet. Um, the full factory pattern is a couple more quirks, but here's what our pizza shop is gonna look like now that we've stripped out object creation. The pizza store contains a, it has a link to a factory and the factory is called when it needs to instantiate a pizza. It's going to prepare and return the object that the pizza store is going to work with. Right, so the pizza store is a client of the simple pizza factory. The simple pizza factory has a method called create pizza where it takes in a string and returns an object of the right type. Okay. Um, it is still going to have that if statement I had earlier, but it's now it's now in one place. Now rather than having that if statement in potentially multiple places in our system, it's only in this pizza factory object. And if we need to change it, we change it in one place. And that's much more self-contained, right? Uh, it's in charge of creating the object and returning it. If it changes, we only have to change in that one spot in the code. So the factory can create any of these pizza types and the client knows how to use them, right? And we have some kind of interface that is going to say, hey, any pizza implements these methods, prepare, bake, cut, and box, right? Uh, and we can create any number of pizza, concrete pizzas um, that implement that particular interface, and we can slot them in as appropriate to the factory, right? Editing that if then else block within the factory. So far, so good. But not all pizzas are the same, right? Um, so I, I, I'm an American. We have our pizza wars like we have our religion wars. Right, a deep dish pepperoni pizza from Chicago is not the same as a pepperoni pizza from New York. So we might wanna offer different hierarchies of options. We might want to let a user select a pizza type, New York or Chicago, then create their then choose their topping type. And in that case, we don't have then, 
might we might not have one pizza factory we might have multiple they're responsible for different sets of products some of the details of creation might differ the options i offered by each might differ so we might have then multiple factories each responsible for its own subset of products right so that's going to create an extra layer of organization we can create a set of factories each factory responsible for the creation of a subset of the, of the products and that means that we might want to create a factory interface and spin that off in the concrete factories that offer the same contract to other methods. Um, we both, our New York and our Chicago pizza factory, are going to implement this create string method or create pizza method that takes in the string, which represents a product type, and it'll both will return an object of type pizza, right? But each one offers different options. Each has its own if, else if, else block within it, right? Um, each one manages the different compatible options of its own and does anything else needed that's independent in order to initialize those objects and return them to the pizza store. Right, so what this means is we're going to create a factory interface and spin off those concrete factories that offer the same contract to other methods, but they differ in their implementation details. Each is responsible for their own products. And from this we can begin to see that uh, what we're really dealing with in the factory pattern are products and creators, both of which have interfaces to do with both offer contracts that they agree to follow in order to present a common interface, right? But we're really dealing here, you have two main concepts, products and creators. So the factory pattern gives us a way to encapsulate the instantiation of concrete product types. We can, it lets us reason in terms of two parallel class hierarchies, creators and products. Factories encapsulate object creation by letting subclasses decide which objects to create. All creators let us pass in options, use those to instantiate an object and pass the right object back. The objects we create are what we call the products and the products might differ in the results of their methods. They, they all offer a common set of methods, okay? So what does this look like in a more general form? This is a little messy with the arrows, but let's go through it. We have a client, right? And the client is concerned with factories and products. That's just any code that needs to, needs to deal with the products we create and the creation of those products. Um, for each product type we build, uh, we have an interface that states the operations that can be assumed of that type of product. So in this case, you know, we have maybe we have two different products. So each of those is going to have an interface describing the, the methods all concrete op products offer, right? So what can we assume is true in terms of the methods offered by each of these concrete products? Likewise, our second one has its own interface, and those are going to implement the, the concrete products for that particular product are going to implement that interface and offer those methods. So these are our pizzas in the previous example, right? We really had one product we build, which is a pizza. A pizza has methods for prep, bake, um, and whatever else was there, prep, bake, ship out, uh, and so on, right? And then we had a number of different concrete pizzas we created. Right. If we made pizzas and sandwiches, we have an interface for pizzas and an interface for sandwiches. All pizzas, all sandwiches follow the same interface they, they implement. We have concrete product classes for each concrete product that we build implementing the appropriate interface. Right. So pepperoni pizza, kebab pizza, right, or a um, chicken sandwich and a steak sandwich. A um, factory interface defines the creation methods for each product type. Right, so we have a factory is going to describe in this case, if we have two products, A and B, pizza and sandwiches, it'll have methods we call to create a pizza and create a sandwich, right? Each factory then, each concrete factory is responsible for creating certain subsets of the concrete products and then links to the products it creates. Other factories handle other subsets of the products. Does that make sense? Is, you know, is that any questions on that so far? Okay, so there's a few benefits we get from implementing the factory pattern then. And the first is that we have loose coupling. We can create and interact with objects without knowing exactly which concrete class we instantiated. Uh, we program to an interface rather than an implementation. We know we have some product of type A. It could be any kind of pizza, but we know we offer, a we offer pizzas, right? 
Uh, class instantiation code is in one centralized place, which means we can change it more easily. We don't have if statements describing the type of pizzas we build in multiple parts of the code. Rather, they're in a single object that we communicate with. So if we have to change the set of pizzas we offer, we can do that in one location. We can more easily incorporate uh, new types of pizza, new classes. It's the idea of encapsulating what changes and only changing that once and protecting that from the code that doesn't necessarily change. Same ideas, different ways of realizing it in your system. Right? Uh, and then fourth, very much related to the first one, is that if we put our creation code in our pizza shop, we have a high dependency in all the different product classes, right? Our pizza shop is going to have to link to all of the individual pizzas and, and so on. And so we directly reference every product that can be created. We need to know about the products that we can create. We can call those constructors directly. If we use factories, we lower that class dependency, right? Everything instead goes through this pizza factory object. We can depend on abstractions. Our code related, or, or, or everything the pizza shop does just works with a, a generic representation of a pizza. It doesn't need to know the difference between a pepperoni and a kebab pizza, it just calls the right methods, right? Um, we can depend on abstractions rather than concrete classes, which is going to allow us to slot in different options. High level components, don't need to know about low level components. Instead, they just de both levels depend on abstractions and don't know need to know the details of each other, right? Both the high level pizza store, the low level pepperoni pizza need to interact, but they don't need to know anything more than what a pizza is and how it can be interfaced with. Right? Any questions so far? Uh, so what we're going to do is let's go ahead and take a break. Um, what we'll do is we'll just come back at two o'clock and continue from there, right? So go ahead and take a 13 minute break.
All right, let's get back into it. Um, there was one question during the break uh, asking about propositional formulas in assignment two. Um, the expectation for that is that you do that process by hand from your model, right? Using the process we talked about in lecture five, where you took the um, visual constructs of the, of the model, mandatory and optional features, as well as or an alternative, those fans, as well as your cross tree constraints, if you have any, and from there derive the propositional formula. So let us know if you have questions on that process. So before the break, we talked about this pizza factory, right? Um, so I'm getting tired now. So now it's all about it's all about the coffee, right? Uh, a, a coffee shop is updating the software for their ordering system, and they've set it up something like this. We have a, a base beverage class with a description and an abstract cost method that we use to assess the bill. Then for each type of drink, they create a child class with a concrete cost method. They have a house blend, a dark roast, a decaf, and an espresso. Uh, pretty reasonable, right? There's a lot of situations like this where we create these specialized children, inherit base properties, and fill in the specifics. However, in addition to your coffee, you can also ask for condiments like milk, um, soy, and mocha. And the coffee shop is gonna charge for each of those. So we have to be able to get the right total, right? So we're not just talking about a house blend, but you might have a house blend with milk, with soy, with milk and mocha. If we decide that those are all special children in their own right, we're gonna run into a nightmare quickly. Right? You say class explosion. They've created a maintenance nightmare here. So what if the price of milk changes? You'd have to go and update that price in dozens of places. What do you do if you add a new topping, add dozens of new classes? No, right, this would be an awful idea. This is, this is something that you would never realistically do, but it's there for a point. That's pretty obviously dumb. You do see design that bad from time to time, but the point is people do over rely on, on inheritance. It's a powerful tool. It's more useful than you think from how much I, I pile on it sometimes, but people misuse it. So when faced with this situation, we want to have different types of coffee and then we want to have different combinations of toppings on top of the drinks. A far more reasonable response is to use an instance variables and inheritance to keep track of our condiments. So take two, here's what we've got. We've got Boolean values for each of the condiments, right? Uh, for milk, soy, mocha, and whipped cream. We, instead of leaving the cost abstract in the parent, what we're gonna go is ahead in, in the parent is we're going to go ahead and calculate the cost of all the condiments. The children are, inherit, are going to inherit and extend the parent method and add the specifics for the child class. So in our house blend, we get the cost of, for the uh, condiments and we're going to add the cost for the house blend, which we're gonna say is 29 crowns and return the total. Much better, right? Uh, see any problems though? There's still some potential issues we could run into when we wanna make changes to this design. So the reason we use inherited primarily is so that we can write code once and inherit it and just rewrite that code in a single place. All children just inherit that functionality. And if we need to change that code later, we just make changes to that parent. As long as the child doesn't overwrite the method, that can be very useful, but it can still lead to designs that aren't completely maintainable and are completely flexible, like our original stab at the coffee store. When you inherit, all children must inherit the same set of functions, the same sets of variables. And so if you just want one function, too bad. You gotta take all of the ones you inherit. And that can lead to situations where you spend more time writing code to work around this new, or work around the behaviors you inherited and the side effects of that inheritance than you spent writing the new functionality that you added to the children. And as we saw with ducks and their flying and their quacking, behavior can also be reused, written once, changed in one place through composition, right? And the idea of composition is that we can take the pieces of the system, these reusable assets, the objects, and we can use those as building blocks of something else and we can swap them out freely. We can grab an object in the system and expand what it can do by attaching an object to it. We had this duck example before of the strategy pattern. We want to enable ducks to fly, but some ducks fly differently from others and some don't fly at all. And so inheritance can't deal with that kind of situation, but we still only want to write code once and reuse it. So we take these flying behaviors 
and we implement each one as part of their own class. Then we attach the appropriate one at object creation, expanding the capabilities of the object that's attached to it. Um, with inheritance, behaviors are passed statically when we compile the code. Every time we run it, the objects are going to have the same features. With composition, we attach objects at runtime. We can even change what features an object has as the system executes by changing the attached object. So if we think back again to those ducks, we just said each has a fly behavior object as an attribute. Well, we could change which specific version of fly behavior is attached when the system runs in response to events going on in the system or based on reconfiguration choices made by the user. Right? Does that make sense? It's an incredibly powerful concept. This allows changes to a class while never changing the code of that class. We can add new functionality by writing new code in separate classes that we attach and call transparently. And because we don't have to change the existing code, the, changes, the chances of introducing bugs are vastly reduced as well. This introduces another fundamental principle of, of design called the open-close principle. The idea that classes should be open for extension but closed for modification. New features are great. We're going to need them, add them away we spend a lot of time testing and debugging the existing code, so we don't modify that. If it isn't broken, don't change it. Change will happen, but we can allow that change to occur without directly modifying the static working code we already have. Instead, take the unchanged class, attach it to a new class that builds in new data, new operations on top of the, of, of the steady trusted code. Um, and it's had new features on top of that. Now, it's not something you want to do everywhere. Um, following this principle means adding new levels of abstraction in your system, which can add complexity to the code and complicate your design. So you want to focus on the areas that are likely to change in your system and apply the principle there. So how do we go back and apply this in practice? We can go back to our coffee shop and we can introduce what's called the decorator pattern. So with our coffee shop, inheritance doesn't solve the problem very elegantly. We get this class explosion or rigid design, or we add functionality to a base class that's not appropriate for some of its children. Uh, so what we want to do instead is start with the beverage and decorate it with condiments at runtime. If our customer wants a dark roast with mocha and whipped cream, here's what we're going to do, right? We start with our dark roast object. Now we will keep some level of inheritance in here. All of our base drinks inherit from a beverage class, right? So we can take advantage of polymorphism to maintain loose coupling. Uh, whether it's a dark roast or an espresso, it all inherits from beverage, so it is a beverage. We know all beverages have a cost method. We can call that, right? So the customer wants a mocha, and so what we can do is we can create a mocha wrap object and wrap it around the dark roast, right? So mocha is a topping here that they want in their dark roast. The mocha object is what we call decorator. It's tight mirrors the object it wraps, so it is also going to inherit from beverage. It attaches through a pointer the dark roast object. It's still a beverage, right? So it can be treated the same way. We know it offers this cost method. Um, and so although conceptually mocha is a topping, design-wise inherits from beverage and it also has a cost method. That means that through polymorphism, any beverage wrapped in the mocha is still a beverage and can be treated the same way it was before. And that maintains loose coupling. Any beverage wrapped in the condiment is still a beverage. And so call, the calling program, the client doesn't need to know what specific beverage it is. It just needs to know that it has a cost method, right? The customer also wants whipped cream. So we're going to create a decorator for whipped cream and then wrap the mocha with that. Right? It's another decorator, and it again maintains a pointer to whatever it is decorating. Right? So its type continues to mirror that of whatever it decorates, so it is still a beverage. Right? And this includes mocha, the other decorator. So a dark roast is now wrapped in the mocha, and the mocha is wrapped in the whipped cream. Right? And it can still do anything that we could do with the dark roast, including calling its cost method. So now when we want to get the, the final cost of our drink, well, we do this by calling costs in the outermost decorator, and it's going to call to whatever object it's wrapping, which will in turn call to the object it's wrapping. And at that point, we get back to the dark roast, right? The whip called the cost method of the mocha, which called the cost method of the dark roast. The dark roast isn't wrapped around anything. 
it's set up to just return its cost, right? So it returns a cost. We add on the cost of the mocha. We add on the cost of the whipped cream. And we finally return the final cost to the calling program. Right. Uh, so Mo Dark Roast returns its price. Mocha adds an additional fee. The whipped cream adds an additional fee. And it returns the grand total to the calling program. So de the decorator pattern attaches additional responsibilities to an object dynamically. This is a nice flexible design alternative to inheritance when you want to extend functionality without modifying the code, right? We can create a dark roast with mocha and whipped cream without changing any code in the dark roast, uh, just attaching an object, attaching an object, right? Um, given the use of, and, and given the use of polymorphism, by inheriting the same supertype, we can pass a decorated object in place of the original object. Everything was still beverage in that example. And that's a key point. The decorator adds its own behavior before or after asking the wrapped object to do the rest of the job. We get functionality from the wrapped objects, then perform any additional work or add any additional features that we want to add without touching the code of the wrapped object. So what does this look like in a design? Well, we can, we can take a look here and applying the decorator pattern is pretty simple. We have two concepts. We have the components. Components are what gets decorated and we have decorators. These wrap around components and extend their data and functionality with new variables and new methods. Right. So uh, we decorators add new behaviors to components. We create a basic component that all the concrete components inherit from. This is like the beverage and then house blend, espresso, dark roast, right, are our concrete components. The components are what we dynamically add new behavior to, right? And each decorator offers the same methods the component offers. Uh, as well as maybe additional methods if they want. So we have a base decorator that defines what all decorators must offer. Since it inherits from component, all decorators offer the methods that all components offer in addition to anything they add on, right? And uh, decorators are going to contain an instance variable to store the object being decorated, store a pointer to it. That's how we keep track of what's being wrapped. We can infinitely keep wrapping just maintain a pointer to the next layer down until we reach the center, right? And decorators can add new behavior by adding additional attributes and operations. Um, often new behavior is added by doing computations before or after calling the existing method in the component, like we did with the cost, right? Where we um, called the cost of the wrap component and then added something on top of that. But you can also add additional operations and additional attributes as well. So if we revisit our coffee shop ordering system, this time with the decorator pattern, we have now two levels of hierarchy. Um, we have types of coffee and all of which extend beverage. So every beverage has a cost method and a description, right? Um, so we have, we have co different concrete beverages we offer. These are the things that get wrapped, right? Uh, these are their decaf or dark roast or espresso or house blend, right? And then we have our condiments and our condiments inherit from beverage as well. These are our decorators that wrap around these different types of coffee. Each has a pointer to the type of beverage and the cost method. And its cost method is going to call the cost method of whatever it wraps, add something on top of that and return the total, right? So our soy milk is going to be, you know, 10 crowns to add on. So we'll add that on to whatever the, the base beverage costs. If we wrap another decorator around that and so on, it's going to continue delegating it down the stream. So the decorator pattern uses inheritance to achieve type matching, but not to inherit behavior. Um, by composing a decorator with a component, we add new behaviors. Composition adds flexibility to how we mix and match these behaviors. And if we rely on inheritance, behavior is determined statically at compile time. We get only the behavior the superclass gives us or that we override. With composition, we can mix and match decorators in any way we like at runtime. We can add new behaviors to the system by writing new decorators. We can extend existing components without changing the underlying components, right? That's a powerful concept. It's very useful, uh, but it does also carry two caveats we need to watch out for. The first is that the decorator pattern often results in a pretty large number of small classes. 
that gives you a design that's harder to understand often and find information in. Um, an example of this is actually Java's IO library, which is implemented using the decorator pattern. When you're reading a file, you often open an input stream, you wrap it in a file input stream, and you wrap that in a buffered reader, right? Uh, this library is a bit of a pain to understand until you think of it as a decorator. Right, your buffered reader decorates the file input stream. It, it delegates some behaviors down to it, but also builds new behaviors on top of that. Uh, there's also potential type issues to watch out for. If a code doesn't need to know the specific type, decorators can be used transparently. Everything's a beverage, but if we have to know something is a dark roast, like a dark roast gets a discount, then bad things can happen once you start applying decorators. It can be really hard to figure out, well, Somewhere underneath all of these, we have um, a dark roast somewhere in there. Now, as we get into our next pattern, um, often we run into a situation where we want to bring in services or code from another system, so you don't have to write that code yourself. Great, yeah, that's normal, right? Reuse of libraries. However, the interface of the code you want to work with might not match elegantly what your code uses, or you might want to work with different um, external libraries and offer the option to switch between them, but, but not all of them are necessarily going to offer the same interface. So how do you work with those systems? Um, one course of action might be to rewrite your code just to work with each of those concrete systems, those different choices, but that's going to take a bunch of time. That might require a huge overhaul, overhaul to how much of your code works, and that's obviously not what we want to do. So what, what's something we can do? And here's the real world analog. Um, if we go to a different country and you pull out your laptop charger, it, it might not go into the outlet, right? Um, different standards for how you convey electricity in different countries. Uh, you're not going to just shove it in there. You need to get an adapter, right? So you plug, you know, you plug your American charger into one end, plug the other end into the outlet, and now it works, right? Some adapters are simple. They just change the shape of your plug. Others are more complex and can vol convert one voltage type into another, but the idea is the same. You don't change the outlet, you don't change the charger, you just stick something between them to make everything work elegantly, right? Uh, we want to do the same thing with our software. You don't want to change your code and you don't want to change and you can't change the vendor's code, right? You got to work with the interface they offer. So what can you do instead? Well, we can write a class to sit in between the two and turn um, the interface of whatever it is we're working with into the one we're expecting. The adapter implements the interface your class expects and talks to the vendor interface to serve requests. It acts as a middleman, a piece of new code that enables you to use your existing system and swap out different external options by just writing a new adapter, right? Doing the mapping that you needed. And this probably sounds a little bit like the decorator pattern, right? And it is. We wrap classes in a new interface to add functionality. It, or in the decorator pattern, we add a new functionality. In the adapter pattern, we're going to wrap classes in a new, cl in, in a new object, which is going to change how we access the underlying object. It adapts the object we're working with for the context we're looking for, right? So it's basically a special case of decorator. Where we're not going to add any behavior here, but we're just going to change how we access existing behavior. So back to our ducks, uh, we have a duck interface and it says all ducks quack and fly. And now we wanna add new birds and there's code available to us for a turkey, okay? Um, turkeys are not necessarily the same thing as ducks. They don't quack, for instance, they gobble. So they're similar, but they don't necessarily offer the same interface. We might not be able to rewrite them. Uh, the turkeys, they might just come in as objects from an imported library and we just got to make use of them. Right. So we might not want to rewrite turkeys or we might, we might not want to rewrite our ducks either. They still don't gobble, but we could write an adapter that lets us map the two. So the turkey adapter just sits in the middle. It's going to attach itself to a turkey. It's going to offer the methods that we expect from a duck, the interface we expect, and it's going to perform some kind of mapping from the methods of the turkey to the methods of the duck, right? This case is pretty easy. Uh, we're just, the quack is just gonna call gobble, the fly can still call fly, but this lets, uh, the, you can see in this, a similar idea to the decorator pattern. 
take an existing class, wrap a new interface around it, right? And call that interface so that it can be, this, this object can be used transparently in the same way you'd use anything else of whatever you're turning it into. Right. So the adapter pattern converts the interface of a class into the interface the client expects. Um, adapters let classes work together despite incompatible interfaces. This pattern allows you to use a client with an incompatible interface by creating an adapter that does that conversion. This decouples the client from the implemented interface. And if that interface ends up changing over time, for instance, if we swap our turkey for something else, or um, we want to change some options, right? And then you use them in a transparent way. The adapter encapsulates that change. So the client doesn't need to be modified every time it needs to operate against a different interface. We just change the adapter. Uh, we contain the change to that and we continue use whatever it is we're adapting transparently. Right. And so that example had the adapter wrapped around one adaptee. The turkey was adapted to match the interface of a duck. Right. So here's what this pattern looks like in the abstract. Pretty straightforward. It's really quite simple. We have some client code. It wants to work with some kind of code that we want to adapt to the interface the client expects. The client is only going to see the target interface, right? The adapter is going to implement the interface that we actually want to work with. The adapter is going to implement that interface and it's going to be composed with the adaptee. It's going to have a pointer to the adaptee it wraps around and requests get delegated uh, from the adapter to the adaptee through the interface presented by the adapter, right? So there's a lot of good object-oriented principles at work here. Um, we can use object composition to wrap the, the adaptee with an altered interface. We can even use the adapter with any subclass of the adaptee. The pattern is gonna bind the client to an interface, not to a particular implementation. And one could even write several situationally appropriate adapters, each converting a different backend class or set of classes Right. Um, for instance, if we were um, developing an app that wanted to work with different social networks, like could send a tweet or send a message to Facebook, send a post to Instagram, uh, rather than having complicated code that works with the different APIs offered by those different social networks, we can instead write an adapter for each social network so that they all offer the same interface and even add new social networks over time and change how we work with the existing social networks by just editing the adapter rather than the, the client code. Any questions in any of this? All right, so what we're gonna do then is we're gonna take another quick five minute break just to uh, digest everything. Let's come back at 228 and we'll do the rest of this. And in the meantime, if there's any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat.
All right, let's go ahead and get back into it. So let's look at another situation. Um, and now what we want to do is we want to watch a movie. And so getting ready for a movie night um, is potentially a complicated process. Uh, for example, you know, you might make up some popcorn, you might turn off your lights, pull it down your uh, projector screen, turn on your projector, set it to the right system, um, turn on your sound amplifier, you know, set your amplifier to its, uh, to the Blu-ray input, set the amplifier, the surround sound, set the volume, the medium, turn on your Blu-ray player, start your movie, etc. Uh, this is probably needlessly complicated, but, um, in any case, this, this gives us a, a situation. It's a lot of work and involves interacting with six different devices and it doesn't really end there. When the movie is over, how do we turn everything off? Same steps in reverse order. Would it be this complex to listen to Spotify or the radio? If you upgrade your system, would you need to learn a completely different startup procedure? Maybe we can make this a bit easier, right? And so the adapter pattern um, converts the interface of a class into the interface the client is expecting. The decorator pattern doesn't alter an interface, but it wraps classes in new functionality. Uh, and there's a third pattern, which is a closely related one that can help with this exact situation. This is something called a facade pattern. The facade pattern simplifies interactions by hiding that complexity behind a clean, easy to understand interface. Uh, the point of this pattern is to wrap a set of classes into one shared interface. Right? And so what we want to do is we want to create a node class. It's called the home theater facade. And what it's going to do is it's going to offer a simple interface. It's going to offer us just a few simple methods, things like start movie or start Spotify, high level things. Like high level functions we might want to perform using this set of underlying classes. Excuse me. Um, the facade treats the home theater components as a subsystem. And it calls on that subsystem to implement its methods. So rather than including that sequence of commands to start the movie, you know, turn on the projector, pull down the screen, start your popcorn maker, or whatever, uh, you take those, all those steps and you implement them once in a method in the facade and then never have to reuse that whole sequence again when using your system later in, in your code. Just call the method in the facade instead, right? Call it simple start movie method. Instead of having within our code that sequence of instructions potentially over and over and over again, right? Um, the client code can work with the facade. The facade just gives us a nice combined interface to the subsystem. It can, the client code can call methods of that facade instead of calling on the individual subsystem classes. And so this sits there and acts as an interface. We no longer have to communicate directly with the lights or the amplifier. We can communicate through the facade, reducing coupling on the individual classes of your system. Um, the facade still leaves the individual classes accessible to use directly. If you need the advanced functionality, it's still there, right? And ready to be used. But the rest of the time, this is going to simplify dependencies in our code because when we just need these high level functions, we can call them through the facade. We can decouple the subsystem from the client code easing change. If change occurs, we can change the facade instead of the client code that calls into the individual classes. All right, so the facade pattern provides a unified interface to a set of class classes in a subsystem. The facade defines a higher level interface that makes the subsystem, the collected set of underlying classes easier to use. There's no encapsulation going on here. Uh, there's no hiding of information. Instead, we're just offering one more method of access. This is a nice property of the facade pattern. We provide a simplified interface while still exposing the full functionality of the system to those who want it. Multiple facades can be defined for the same subsystem, the same classes, even to provide different situational functions. And this decouples the client from any one subsystem. So if you go in and you add a new home theater component, you just need to change that facade rather than the code in the client system. In terms of a class diagram, this is dead simple. A client is associated with a facade, which acts as a layer between a client and a potentially comp complicated web of subsystem classes. There isn't much more to it than that, but the idea is a powerful one. 
This tells us loud and clear the intent of this pattern. It puts a simplified, changeable interface between your code and a complex, highly connected set of classes. That leads us into, an, into another important design idea. And that's what's called the principle of least knowledge. This is the idea that you should talk only to your, your immediate friends. You can reduce the number of interactions between objects whenever possible. When you're designing a class, be careful of the number of classes it interacts with and how it comes to interact with them. This prevents us from creating designs that are highly coupled together. When you have a lot of dependencies, you're building a fragile system that will be expensive to maintain. It's gonna be complex for others to understand. We only invoke methods that belong to the system, it's, to the object itself, objects passed as parameters to it, objects that the method creates or instantiates, and then components of this object. The facade pattern maintains this idea by ensuring the client is only one friend. The facade, right? You're, so your client works with this interface and not with the big web of underlying classes. Our, our one friend only having connecting to this facade is a good thing. The facade keeps the client simple and flexible by managing the subsystem components for the client. It adds in the simple interface layer and we only need to worry about understanding what that interface offers. We can upgrade the home theater. We could change how Blu-rays are played or, or add new, you know, new streaming services. Without, up, without upgrading the code in the client that does things with that theater, like watching the Blu-rays. Okay. Um, now, a little earlier, we talked an awful lot about our coffee shop. And some of us can't live without our coffee, uh, like me. Some of us are maybe tea maniacs instead. Right? And as it turns out, coffee and tea are made in a very similar way. You know, basically, you boil some water, you, you, know, you um, brew a beverage, you know, maybe you brew your coffee in the boiling water, you pour coffee in the cup, and you add sugar or milk or whatever you're going to add to it. Or for our tea, we're going to boil some water, steep the tea in the boiling water, pour the tea in a cup, and add, you know, maybe add lemon to it or something. Right? So pretty similar process. It sounds a lot alike. So we can look at this, how, how uh, you can see how each of these might look in the system that we're building to brew both. Uh, for instance, our coffee, we have a set of methods. We prepared a recipe, we boil the water, we brew our coffee grinds, we pour in a cup and we add sugar and milk. And our prepare recipe method just steps through the sequence of actions. For the tea, we have boil water, steep tea bag, pour in cup, add lemon methods. And those are the step, uh, series of steps called by the prepare recipe method. Right. Um, basically, these are almost the same recipe, right? You, you likely have some code duplication going on here. And when we have duplication, that's a good sign that we need to clean up our design. So our first inclination, right? We should maybe take these common steps, uh, abstract them into a base class and inherit those common steps, right? So our first redesign might look, at, look a bit like this. Um, we have an abstract prepare recipe method that's implemented in each child. We have common methods in the parent, boil water and pour in cup are, are common for all of our caffeine beverages. And then coffee and tea implement their own unique steps. So is this good enough? Any other um, commonality we're overlooking? Are there other ways that coffee and tea are similar that we could take advantage of? And so what else do coffee and tea have in common? Well, we can look at their recipes again and both recipes follow essentially the same algorithm. Boil some water, Use your hot water to extract the beverage from a solid form, pour it into a cup, and add appropriate condiments to the beverage, right? And so in our current approach, steps one and three, boil water, pour into a cup, those are already in the base class. Two and four aren't. Use hot water to extract the beverage into a solid form, add appropriate condiments to the beverage, but they're the same concept applied to different beverages, right? So can we find a way to abstract the prepare recipe as well? All right, so for coffee, we have brew coffee grounds, add sugar and milk. For tea, we have steep tea bag and add lemon. Uh, steeping and brewing really aren't all that different, right? So we could just have a brew method, adding sugar and adding lemon have a lot in common too, right? So we can have an add condiment step. So we can create this prepare recipe method that just steps through the sequence of steps. Boil water, brew, pour in cup, add condiments. And this could be the same for both of these for both coffee and tea, for both of our beverages, and then potentially for other beverages in the future, right? Um, 
So we can redesign this code a little bit, right? We can have a caffeine beverage with a prepare recipe method, um, an abstract boil or brew and add condiments, and then concrete boil water and pour in cup. And then each of these children implement the code themselves that's unique, right? Uh, we have, you know, this, this class caffeine beverage, it's, it's, you know, it's an abstract class, and then we have concrete children that we create. Um, the same prepare recipe method is going to be used to make both tea and coffee, but they both depend on a concrete brew and add condiment method that's defined in the children. These are handled in different ways. So the parent they're declared as abstract, right? And um, the parent does implement boil water and pour in a cup. All right, so then we go and deal with these coffee and tea classes. They rely on caffeine beverage to handle the recipe, so they just need to handle brewing and the condiments. Uh, so what have we done here? Well, we recognize the two recipes are essentially the same, although some of the steps require different implementations. So we generalized the recipe as an algorithm and placed it in the base class. Caffeine beverage knows and controls the steps of the recipe. It performs common steps itself, uh, encapsulate, encapsulating what doesn't change. It separates it then from what does change, which is embodied in the subclasses, which implement the unique steps. And so this is what's called the template method pattern. This is the behavioral pattern that, um, that basically wraps around an algorithm. Um, we have prepare recipe that says, hey, you know, go boil some water, brew your beverage, pour it in a cup and add condiments. This serves as a template for an algorithm. The, you know, this is a method that serves as a template for an algorithm called that our template method. In this case, it's an algorithm for making caffeinated beverages. In the template, every step of the algorithm is represented by a method. And some methods are handled by the base class while others are delegated to subclasses that we plug in, which can change. The methods that need to be supplied by the subclass are declared abstract. The template method then defines the steps of an algorithm, this recipe, and it allows subclasses to swap out different implementations from one or more steps of that algorithm, allowing us to plug in different options based on the choices we've made, right? So what does this do for us? Well, in the original implementation, coffee and tea control the algorithm. We have duplicated code between them and any changes to the algorithm require changes to the subclasses. The classes are organized in a structure that requires more work to add a new beverage, right? Because we're duplicating code. And knowledge of the algorithm and how they implement it is distributed over multiple classes. And so it's hard to necessarily understand that there are these common elements by abstracting the recipe into the parent, delegating concrete differences to the child classes in the template method pattern, we have this parent class, caffeine beverage, which controls and protects the algorithm. It implements the common code. The algorithm lives in one place. It changes to the actual recipe only happen in one location. The template method allows new beverages to be added pretty easily, right? And they're just going to swap out the elements that they need to swap and with their own specialized methods. And the caffeine beverage class controls all of our knowledge about the algorithm, uh, relying on subclasses to provide concrete implementations. Right? So there's a question in the chat, why shouldn't we use the decorator pattern here instead? It's um, in a way, it's kind of a similar idea. All these links, this is, this is just kind of a nice specialized um, version of this where what we want to do is we want to have a common algorithm and swap individual steps of it rather than having different functionality that we're building on top of other classes. So it's kind of a difference in aim. It's the template method pattern defines the skeleton of an algorithm in a method deferring some of the steps to subclasses. Um, template method lets subclasses redefine certain steps of an algorithm without changing the structure of the algorithm itself. So we have this universal structure that doesn't change, but certain steps we want to enable different options to be chosen for. Uh, a template is a method that defines an algorithm as a set of set steps and abstract steps are implemented by subclasses. This ensures the algorithm structure stays unchanged. Again, it's, it's a way of protecting what does not change from what does change, right, in, a, in an elegant form. So in terms of our class diagram, it looks a bit like this. We have an abstract class 
This is going to contain our template method, which is a set of method calls and an abstract version of the operations used by the method, right? Uh, we can have a number of different concrete children. Um, these are going to implement the concrete operations required, the what does differ, right? Whereas in the parent, we have parts that don't differ. Um, if we look inside this a little bit, if we look inside our, our parent class, right? We can call it an abstract class. It's got this, this template method, which is our, our algorithm, our set of steps. We declare it final to prevent the subclasses from changing the sequence of steps in the operation, right? So when we call it, it's going to be the same operations in the same order, but some of the implementation details are going to be defined by the children, right? Um, we have some concrete operations in the parent. What doesn't change, those things are shared by all the children. And these are steps that do change between them. Right. Um, there's a question, if we replace beverages with robots, how would we implement these patterns? I mean, it depends on the pattern. Um, you can think about that some. This might be a case where, how I'm trying to think of an example at the top of my head. Um, maybe we have a, maybe we have some kind of game that the robots play, like the robots all play basketball or something. And um, we have the set of operations that you take to throw the ball into a basket. And that might be different. That, that might be something like uh, the arm has to rotate into a position and then throw the ball. I don't know. I'm just trying to make up an example off the top of my head, right? And the set of operations, the set of steps is the same, but there's low level implementation details that differ between the bots. All right. So, okay. Robot tank. I, yeah. I'm just trying to think of a, of a dumb example. Um, you have some sort of, this is a case you have some sort of common operation between the different robots, right? And then they, they all will go through uh, the same steps, but some of the individual steps might differ between them. So um, a ro two robots might uh, move their guns differently, right? If they're going to move you know, a, a gun turret to fire a shot um, and the, each of the bots will define the movement operation, but we, we at the top level, we know all of them have some sort of concrete movement process, right? And you can map it in that way. Um, I don't know if that helps. I'm just, yeah, I'm struggling to come up with an example off the top of my head of like a common operation for this pattern. Um, but you can think a little bit how you would implement this for a certain domain, just stare at these examples. We can talk more about it after class too, but I want to make sure I just cover the rest of this too. All right, the parent class can define concrete methods that are empty too or have a default implementation and we call these hooks where the subclasses can override those, but they don't necessarily have to and that gives subclasses the ability to hook into the algorithm if they want to. Um, and so we've can add a little conditional statement into the recipe that bases its success on the concrete method called once condiments. Um, so in our recipe, if the, you know, if the customer wants condiments, it'll add them. And we put together a default implementation. The default is true. They, of course, they, yeah, they absolutely want to have sugar and milk in their coffee, right? So as a default implementation, this returns true. But in the child, we could all we could add a more complicated overrided version of this. Right, and we can maybe get user input, and if they say yes, we're going to return true, and otherwise we'll return false or something else. Right, and this gives us a way to create a default implementation. Um, if we create a new beverage, we could say that they always want condiments, right, and just not worry about overriding this. Or we could create a new beverage that does override this in the complicated way. Uh, this gives us a way to provide a default implementation so that we can override something, but we don't have to. The T class might not override this. And so we get the we get milk in our tea, whether we want it or not. In the coffee, we are going to override this. And we ask the user if they do want condiments through an additional method that's not part of the core algorithm. And it turns out this is another design principle, what's called the Hollywood principle. Um, don't, don't call us, we'll call you, right? Uh, what does this have to do with OO development? Well, this, what, this prevents something called dependency rot. 
uh, when you have high level components that depend on low level components and those components depend on high level components and they have the circular dependency between them. It creates a cycle between the high and the low level. Uh, when you have dependency rot, it's hard to understand how your system was designed. And so the, the, if you implement this Hollywood principle, this is going to let your low level components hook into the system, but your high level components decide when and how they're needed. And that prevents a circular dependency. In other words, high level components give the low level components this don't, don't call us, we'll call you kind of treatment. Um, where the high levels call the low levels, but not in reverse. So, so when we design with the template method, we tell the subclasses, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. The, the coffee, the tea, they don't call the parent class. The parent class works with them. Caffeine beverage maintains control over the algorithm and calls subclasses only when they're needed for an implementation of a method. The low level subclasses are used simply to provide implementation details. Uh, and tea and coffee, the low level classes never call caffeine beverage, never call the high level class with, directly without being called first. Clients, the beverages depend on the caffeine beverage rather than the low level, uh, the low level concrete coffee or tea, which is going to reduce dependencies in your overall system. All right, so these patterns capture a bunch of different design principles that allow evolution and variability in your system without increasing complexity. First of these, you can identify the aspects that vary in your system, the choices you can make, and then encapsulate them away from what doesn't change, what remains constant. This is a big idea. This is what almost all of OO design in some form is based on. Take the parts of the program that will change, separate them as much as possible from what doesn't change, keep them loosely coupled, changes won't wreck your system. Second, program to an interface rather than an implementation. If you plan to have multiple objects that are similar, but vary in their low level design or their low level details, design some sort of common interface that all these specialized concrete versions adhere to. If you're designing a system with multiple ducts, ensure they all offer the same set of operations called in the same method of invocation. Even if they make different noises when they quack, make, making them all quack using the same interface. That way we can design our system to not require knowledge of the individual parts that we're plugging into it. Um, third, favor composition over inheritance. Although inheritance is a really powerful feature, passing a, a type and a set of methods along, it can be very rigid. The children have to accept all functionality passed from a parent and the abilities passed along are determined statically at compile time. By using composition to build a class, and uh, uh, we, we can dynamically extend the abilities of an object at runtime by attaching other objects to it. We could still write functionality once and change it in one place, but without the rigidity of the inheritance, which is going to feed directly into the open close principle, right? That classes are open for extension, but closed for modification. So we wanna be able to extend the abilities of a class in the future, but do so as much as possible without having to alter the existing code. The existing code has been debugged, if we have to rewrite it to add new functionality, well, um, we can. what we might do is we might add new bugs into the code that we thought was working, right? Fifth, talk only to your immediate friends. When you're designing a class, be careful the number of classes it interacts with and how it comes to interact with them. Avoid coupling. And sixth, don't call us, we'll call you. Uh, low level components should never um, depend on the high level components. The high level components, your system instead should control and, and interact with the low level components, but not have a circular dependency. Clients will depend on the high level abstraction rather than the concrete low level implementation, which will reduce dependencies in your overall system. Now, design patterns are not a magical bullet. You can't just plug one in, compile, and go for coffee. You need to avoid the constant, or you need to consider the consequences of patterns on your design, right? So there are some drawbacks here to consider when deciding when and when not to use patterns. Some of these give you a, an over-engineered solution or increase your system complexity and lower its understandability. Some of them introduce um, overhead into your design, which is going to result in poor performance, right? So it's better just to be a good designer, but these give us some nice core ideas to work with. So to summarize a little bit, uh, design patterns allow implementation and management of variability in your code. They take those principles of OO design and show us how to realize them within our software. 
These take common situations and design and offer tips on how to build your system so that you can swap different elements in the future, evolve the elements, change elements, add and remove elements without changing the parts of the code that don't um, change over time. Uh, we've considered a set here that are suitable to product lines and the systems built around asset reuse and evolution. The strategy pattern encapsulates interchangeable behaviors in their own classes and uses delegation to, to decide which to use, swapping them at runtime. The factory pattern encapsulates object creation so that creation details are um, hidden away. And what we really just need to know is we can pass in a request and get the right object back and work with those objects in a transparent manner. The decorator pattern wraps an object in another object to provide new behaviors without code changes. Uh, the adapter pattern is going to wrap an object in a new interface, while the, the, the facade pattern wraps a set of classes in a simplified interface. Oops. And something happened here. All right, where is your... Uh, all right, I am having some occasional technical issues here with this computer. All right, uh, let's see. And it looks like my slides are back. There we go. Uh, yeah, and then the, the template matter pet method pattern encapsulates pieces of your algorithm so subclasses can hook into a computation. Right. Um, let's see here. And so that's really about all we had. Fortunately, the random crash of everything and the screen going blank waited until the end. Um, next class, we're going to continue to talk about design by looking at modularity. Um, the assignments due this weekend. That's all I have, but feel free to stick around if you have any questions and ask them um, and to respond to a couple of things that have come up. Um, There's the question earlier about how to apply these to a system, maybe with a robotic tank, something like RoboCode. And a couple of things come to mind that we could talk about. Um, the factory pattern you, you, that we use to encapsulate object creation, that's something that's very directly applicable where we could pass in a set of options and get back the exact bot we asked for, right? So that's just a nice way to control the creation of the objects um, so that you don't have to have huge if statements in multiple places to determine which type of object you're going to create. Instead, this factory creates and gives it to you. The strategy pattern um, we saw with the ducks that you could attach different flying and quacking behaviors. Well, this one is nice um, because um, let's say that your robot tanks had a set of targeting behaviors for how they went and targeted different, different opponents. Some of your bots are going to reuse the same targeting behavior, right? So rather than implementing that targeting behavior independently in each bot and then having to change it in each, if you change that algorithm, what you could do is you could create a class that represents each of your targeting behaviors and then um, plug those in to a bot at runtime, right? Based on what type of bot it is and what type it needs to use. Or even that lets you create bots that support different kinds of targeting behavior and you can swap between them. But you have classes that represent targeting behaviors and you change between them. Make sense, All right? Um, the decorator pattern could be used if you wanted to design a new variant of an existing bot that uh, either slightly changes its behavior or adds new behaviors on top of it. So you take the original bot, which now you don't have to change. It already works. You already trust it. You um, create a new bot, which just has a pointer to that. And it adds either new methods as well as calling methods from the bot it's wrapped around or it could take the the behavior of a common method, like so say a targeting behavior. It could take the targeting behavior of the existing bot and um, add changes uh, that either take place before or after calling that targeting behavior, just to extend that functionality. All right, so those are some of the ones I think are very applicable to, to this, this RoboCode-esque scenario. The others are maybe a little less so, but are good for other types of systems. Um, for instance, if we designed an interface for working with bots and we wanted to import some bots from a completely different framework, we could use the adapter pattern to, to adapt their interface to the one we expect for the ones in our system. 
Uh, the facade one, I think, is not really as applicable to that situation. And I'm not really sure about the template method pattern I was trying to come up with earlier an example for that. And I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with to how to apply that one to a robocode. But it's good for other cases where we have a common algorithm, but we have different options for certain steps of it. For instance, like different options for how we would sort um, some data and then make use of it in an algorithm. Does that help with addressing your question from earlier? All right, so let's say we have a bot that changes behavior when it notices its evasive behavior isn't working. Uh, could you use a state pattern? Yeah, sure. You can use, yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, there's, there's a zillion different ways you can implement this. What you want to do is think about what's going to work best for your particular situation, right? Um, So for instance, one thing in case where the strategy pattern might make a lot of sense is rather than necessarily creating a bunch of different classes for different bots, we could create one bot class. And then we could instantiate on the targeting behavior we attach to that based on the set of options chosen, right? So we could return just a bot that we've attached the right objects to for its different targeting, movement, et cetera, behaviors. Right, and so it's it's just different implementation ideas. Um, could you use a state pattern? Sure. Uh, it's really just a matter of, of what you think makes the most sense in your design, and allows you to change options easily. Right. So the the key thing here is that you want to be able to swap between different options in a transparent way. You want to not mix the behavior of different features as much as you can. Right, keep the feature code separate in nice changeable units that you can then swap into place. And that's going to allow your system to evolve in a much more transparent way. Any other questions on that? Or does that, are there parts you're still confused on? Okay. Um, then what we can do is we can wrap up a little bit. And I'll hang out for a couple more minutes to answer any other questions people have, but otherwise we can just be done for today. Come on.